If you would like to support the podcast and get some extra content while you're there, head on over to patreon.com forward slash severe MMA podcast and sign up from the rewatch to the Q&A. We will have loads of content every week. So sign up patreon.com forward slash severe MMA podcast. And now. Episode 419 of the Severe MMA Podcast. My name is Sean Sheehan, joined today by the Mason Mount of Irish MMA Media, Graham MacDonald, as we talk about a very... Uh, busy... I will not be joining Manchester United, we, just for the, yeah, the record. Yeah, we fucking better than some of the useless bastards we have anyway, but sure, but look, even with your dodgy knee, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll take you. Anyway, we're going to talk a, a lot about mixed martial arts today. There was obviously a big weekend uh, just went by and an even bigger one coming up. Before we get into all of that, here we go with Manscaped. Friends, family and loved ones, I bet you haven't pur- purchased a Father's Day gift yet. I know I haven't. Uh, <laughs> not to fear, the leaders in Below the West Grooming are here. I'm talking about our friends at Manscaped. They're saving the day yet again with the total package for the father figure in your life this year. It's time to upgrade his game from waist to face with this exclusive offer. Have him join the 8 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. I know, Graham, last year you gave your dad the, 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 the nose and ear clipper, didn't you? <laughs> last year, so. Yeah, I gave my uh, father in law. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'm like, I hope he takes this well and doesn't think I'm sending a message or anything. There's always a bit, of, <laughs> a bit of that going on with the language barrier and things like that, but oh, yeah. uh, he was delighted with it. So, uh, <laughs> the, the law, the law was, the law was there in the end. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> But the performance package four by those is a great gift for uh, your father, your father in law, your your brother in law, maybe your husband or your whatever it might be. Uh, and inside the package, you'll find the lawnmower four point zero, which is a cordless body trimmer, and ton of other liquid formish, formulations, even to round out uh, the grooming routine. This trimmer features a ceramic blade designed to cut uh, hair on loose skin and reduce grooming accidents, thanks to the advanced skin safe technology. An absolute game changer for trimming in sensitive areas and as Graham was just describing as well uh, Manscaped have the Weed Whacker 2.0 nose and ear hair trimmer this is a perfect gift uh, for Father's Day and he will actually use it as well this beautiful bundle all, all, also comes with the Crop Preserver Ball the Odin Crop Toner which for these fucking Russian hot days you definitely need them but also the Boxer Briefs and the Shed Travel Bag to put them all in in. We all know dads love their comfort. If this grooming routine is already dialed, make sure to hook him up with the Manscaped Boxers 2.0, as I mentioned, the best boxers for the family jewels which you came from if he's your dead. Whether it's mowing the lawn, laying out the trash, or golfing in the sun, these moisture wicking boxes breed without breaking a sweat. So get 20% off and free shipping to code severe, make, uh, severe MMA at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code severe MMA. Make this Father's Day one he won't forget with Manscaped. And another thing you can get for your dad for, for, uh, uh, Father's Day is uh, from our friends over at Caldera Lab. They're absolutely brilliant. They're a new sponsor of ours, and they're here to get your you ready for uh, your skin ready even for the summer. And we're well and truly in the summer now. Um, it's backed by a leading clinical trial where nine out of ten men ex- experienced healthier and visibly improved skin. Caldera Lab has tools to keep your skin fresh and confident as the weather heats up. Today we have an exclusive offer for our audience so you can try uh, why so many mil 
Trust Caldera Lab for their skin needs. Use the code SEVEREMMA at calderalab.com for 20% off their best products. Caldera Lab is is absolutely brilliant. They create high-performance skin skincare products uh, by combining pharmaceutical grade science along with nature's purest and most potent uh, ingredients. You know, we all get a little bit older, Graham, don't we? And, uh, you know, we need a bit of we need a bit of help for those lines and those signs of aging and all. And there's some great stuff. The Regimen Bundle is is uh, the leader of their lineup. It's a twice a day routine to transform your skin in it. The, the clean slate to start off your day. It's a balancing cleanser, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. The base layer is a nutrient-dense fortifying moisturizer that helps... Uh, Hydrate skin. Do you know what I found out actually the other day? Moisturizer. Moist. It puts moisture into your face. I'd never realized that. I'm 35 years of age and <laughs> realized last week that moisturizer. Is a, so yeah, then the Caldera Lab will help you out. If you're an idiot like me, it'll help you out. And also, the good, it's your go to before night clinically proven uh, multifunctional serum that helps your skin look tighter and smoother. And do you know what? That's exactly what you want. The eye condition as well for around your eyes, it helps address the three most common. Uh, skin concerned around the eyes, the fine lines, dark circles, and puffiness. But Caldera Lab, they're absolutely brilliant. They're committed, like ourselves, to to doing it the right way with their transparency, sustainability, excellence. It's on a mission to better men's skincare around the world, priding itself on clean ingredients and doing right by their customers and the planet we live in. Caldera Lab is a certified B Corporation as well as a member of the 1% for the planet. Through uncompromising craftsmanship, exceptional ingredients, and rigorous transparency, Caldera Lab is here to upgrade your skin and confidence. So get 20% off with our code severe at calderalab.com C-A-L-D-E-R-A-L-A-B dot com by using the code severe MMA. Take your skincare next level this summer with Caldera Lab. Right, do you remember before on our YouTube, or maybe it's still there, remember you used to have, it was something like that, true uncompromising craftsmanship and in, in exceptional ingredient. Remember you? <laughs> Adhering like to rigorous standards. That was it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a good definition of severe, severe yeah. yeah. The, the name severe, I was like, we we have it now, we're stuck with it. I never liked it at the start. It's grown on me, but like, why, why would yeah. you come up I with remember I, I'm trying, trying to sign up for loads of different ones. I'm like checking the social medias and checking the domain names and just everything being either one of them or the other being taken on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or the domain name and just going through a list and just, I don't know. I also wanted something that kind of, if you say the first word, you know, you know, it's unique as well. So if people just say severe, instead of having to say severemma.com, everybody knows what you're talking about. So I thought that was good. But yeah, I can understand that it's, you know, it's kind of a word that has multiple meanings as well. So I kind of like that as well. Yeah, that's true. You can, you can use it a few different ways. Sometimes you see severe pop it up. It's funny as well, you know, do you ever, if you ever Google severe MMA, it's always like fighter sustains severe injuries. I'm like, okay, well, maybe that's not, maybe that's not the best fucking thing to, to be associated with. But look, sure, look, that happens as well. And we, we, we can't. You said we're, we're stuck with it now anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we're stuck with it. Maybe we should have thought that through a bit more. Uh, anyway, maybe powerhouse uh, available. We can <laughs> I can take the stuff out. I was actually telling my missus the other day about you and Powerhouse and how you're you had this big rivalry and everything like that. And oh, Jesus was those mad days back then, wasn't it? Uh, I feel like you won the rivalry now, Graham Dawn Dean. Although Alan's doing and we're gonna talk about KFC uh, KFC, KSW now here in a second, but KFC. You, you did a great job uh winning that war for Irish MMA, Graham, didn't you? Fair play. And there's no one else now, basically. It's just us fucking talking shite. Who's the who's the real winner? <laughs> it's a boss out of all of that. But anyway, we'll uh, we'll get into it. I don't know. I think it was I think it was others always kind of making it seem like it was a it was a war and maybe you're you're still doing that. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. I I because like I I never really knew about the war and I just uh, met Alan a couple of times and was like chatting away and then everyone's like oh you can't, oh you're chatting to the powerhouse yeah like yeah what <laughs> what, what difference does it make anyway anyway that's maybe we should get Joy you should do you should get Alan on like the ten years of severe meeting and have a chat with him that'd actually be good but it'd be like the yeah, twelve years the, of severe twelve years of severe meeting twelve and a half years I don't know whatever but no but Alan's the same guy uh, you is, know yeah. he's uh, he's doing very well with uh, with KSW and you know KSW are Going, doing great things and like a huge show like that was very impressive as, as we mentioned when they're in Dublin their production is always spot on so yeah you know fair play to them it's, it's hard to to make a living in this MMA world yeah indeed let's uh, let's have a case of you all together while we uh, while we're here and it was 
it was madness. It was absolutely crazy tuning in to watch that. I did uh, the preview the other day, and I had Sean Dini on over on uh, our um, our Patreon for the preview as well, and he did a great job with myself and Ian breaking it down on the chasing pack. Um, and it was even more crazy than I suppose we even previewed, because you it's grand to say, oh, there's going to be 45, 50,000 people there, but then you actually tune in and watch it. But then... You know, after it's over, tuning in straight away over to the UFC Apex and seeing the fucking thirty-five people in the crowd there, it was it was literally it was like a thirty-five. Shock that's, a bit, that's a bit of an overestimation <laughs> by, by what I thought. <laughs> My favorite much, yeah. but it's it's a literal like shock to this. I'm like, why is this happening? One is supposed to be like the world leader in MMA, and the other is you know this local Polish promotion, and also as well with this week the Mick Maynard came out uh, and he was like so fervent, like our last week. Even calling out bloody elbow and like, oh, they're going to complain about this week's fights, even though there's no fights this week. And he's like, oh, when was last time there was a bad card? The week after he had put on a main event between Angela Hill and Mackenzie Dern. Like, are you, are you actually serious? <laughs> like, what, what is going on here? It's like, uh, and that's a like, yeah. I for a man who doesn't problem. come out and speak very much, is, <laughs> you know, it's a strange uh, thing to very come out strange. And, come out and, and, and uh, it's, proclaim. It's a bad, it's a bad thing because he felt so confident. In coming out and saying it and, and like giving out about people complaining about how terrible some of these cards have been. It, it, it and I think um, uh, Kid Nate from Bloody Elba actually replied to him and goes, Look, we love the UFC when it's at its best. Just try to make it a little bit better. <laughs> it's just like, I you know, know it actually, like, wants. you know, obviously, Mick Maynard and Sean Shelby are. You know, dealing with a lot of fighters, a lot of cards all the time. It is a difficult job. Oh, you know, there very is hard. There way too many fighters, world. way too many divisions, way too many events to deal with. They, they, there definitely needs to be a much bigger team of, of matchmakers, in my opinion. Like, you know, it was okay with Joe Silva when there was, what, a couple hundred fighters on the roster and or five divisions. But then, you know, when they brought in the extra divisions from WEC and things like that, they, they brought in Sean Shelby. And obviously, Mick Maynard was brought in there, but Joe Silva was never really replaced, and he was so important. And, you know, even one man probably couldn't do his job. And even Joe Silva probably couldn't do his job uh, the way he did it uh, in the current climate climate of um, of the size of the roster and the the amount of shows. And the pressure isn't really uh, on the UFC to put on the best cards anymore with ESPN. You know, even for the pay-per-views, they're getting an automatic uh, 500K pay-per-view um deal for each one and uh espn are just happy to put on w- whatever cards it seems you know they're kind of usc are in a really strong position so it's it's you know i don't see it getting getting better anytime soon but i would love to see you know other matchmakers brought on and you know ease the load on mick Maynard and john shelby it probably is you know they're they basically been in the circus for the last how many how many years and decades and john shelby's uh case so uh, i could see why they might be annoyed with people complaining like you know they're they probably are doing their best for such a small team and all that but yeah something needs to change because yeah i think we've talked about it there's a lot of cards where you know we, we we're doing the podcast we're breaking down the, the previous card and the next card we're kind of looking at it and being like god oh, there's not much there and you know that used to never be the case with the ufc it used to always be really exciting and it is a shame but yeah it's it's in my opinion it's probably it's probably not going to change anytime soon. No, I don't think so. Myself and Spencer talked about it kind of more in depth even last week. And, you know, th- this podcast has changed, I think, because of that as well. Because, like, we are less concerned or breaking down every single fight. Whereas years ago, that would have been what everyone wanted and what we would have wanted to do ourselves as well. And it's just, like, it's just not the case anymore. And that's, you know, that's actually, it's fine from our point of view. But from the UFC's point of view, uh, let's see how long that will actually last in terms of them being successful with it. Because, you know, it's all well and good. It's gone up and up and up in the amount of money and all. But, like, I mean... I wonder if that lasts because people are definitely getting tired of it and definitely getting sick of it. But yeah, I uh, I don't know. It's like there's, there's, I heard some talk. I don't know how reliable this is, but if they do kind of split it up into like say have some events on Fox, have some events on um, ESPN, have some events on CBS or whatever, mix mix the kind of the broadcasters, then they the UFC might come, come under a little bit more pressure from the individual broadcasters yes. to have certain standard or certain belts on the line or certain, you know, ranked number ranked fighters uh, at the very least on, on a main card or things like that. So maybe that could change it if, if they go for that and kind of split up the, the broadcasters. But if they sign with an individual broadcaster again, I think we're kind of, 
we're in it for the long haul. Yeah, indeed. And if they get the same kind of sweetheart deal that they got the last time, they probably will be. Uh, <laughs> they, they they just won't care again. But how long like will want not caring actually benefit them? But we'll we'll uh, we'll see on that. But on the, on the matching everything, my sister Winter talked about that as well last week. Uh, it's insanity to only have two people doing that because if you think about it, right, just their matchmaking, it's tough enough to do that. But then they're the people as well. If someone's getting signed to the UFC, they're the ones who kind of half making the decision. If it, unless it's someone big and with you know big money or whatever and you hear like people saying oh, obviously with us in Irish MMA oh, I was talking to Mick Maynard and Mick Maynard says I need to get another win or Mick Maynard says I need to get a finish it's always Mick Maynard chance. and those lads just do not have the time they couldn't possibly there needs to be at least another one or two more I would think even matchmakers brought in to help and uh, it's it's mad anyway we'll that could be a chat we got to have uh, for a, a, an hour on another day. But today there is a, a lot to talk about. And as I said, getting back to KSW, that that insane crowd, it just like it just shows what can be done. Like we've seen it here in Ireland for years now. Obviously the crowd isn't as big, but to create a, um, a distinctive... Uh, yeah, a spectacle, but a distinctive, um, you know, a fucking group in one area that can have this massive fan base, this massive hype around them. And um, it, it, it's great because the fans love it. It's great for the fighters it, over in KSW. They're getting great money and it's just brilliant to be able to, to be able to have something like that. And like, we always had it in sports. We always had it. Like if you look at say, the, the Premier League or whatever, look at the crowds like Liverpool get or Man United get or Wrexham get or, you know, Salford FC get or Luton down. It's it's great. Like these big areas or small areas get this great, fervent local support. And that's exactly what KSW has. But it's <laughs> to call it a local event is absolutely insane considering how big it actually is and the level of fighters they actually have. And, the you know, yeah, and even you talk about the level of fighters, they have some very, very, very good top level fighters, but they have just some fun fights as well and some mad stuff and all. It's absolutely it's absolutely brilliant what KSW are doing. And I think the main event was was brilliant. You know, Mamma Kaladov versus Scott Askham. I previewed it coming in and a lot of that talk from myself and I think Dinny said it as well and Ian. It was like, Oh, is Askham gonna try to take him down again like in the first fight? You know, Kaladov is obviously very dangerous on the feet, and it was the exact opposite. Kaladov took him down for the first two rounds and was winning the fight, in my opinion, although there was a couple of leg locks and things like that, but I, I thought he was ahead. Yeah, those leg locks, like Hadi Kalidov was pretty calm and pretty relaxed and didn't see him in much. I think it was more just trying to reverse the position for, for Askham in them positions. I think he was, as you said, caught unawares. I think his game plan probably was to kind of get on top and and wear on Halidov, and he was kind of taken out of wares by Halidov coming and uh, uh, wrestling him, and... You know, obviously the the finish was was absolutely beautiful and things like that. But the game plan overall was 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 really good and just took Askham out of his game and you know hanging onto them kind of legs and go. I never really thought he had any kind of near near ending submission. I think it was more of a just kind of changing the position and trying to get on top using those leg locks. But it, you know, it didn't really work out. It ended up just kind of a stalemate there. Yeah, and it, it, it did indeed for most of the time. And then the fight ended like the last one ended with a knockout of the year contender. Uh, ask him, well, he kind of got knocked down, got back up, and Halidov hit him with the most perfectly timed Paolo de Canio kick right to the face. Yeah, and the knee was like an him. inch off the, the canvas. It was just yeah, perfect. Perfect. Absolutely brilliant. If you haven't seen that, go back and uh, go back and check it out. It was an awful pity though. The Coleman event got cancelled like minutes before. Literally, they were in their gloves and all. Uh, Martin Zakowski and Saldin Parna. Zakowski uh, torn his ligaments literally as as they were warming up to come out and that was very unfortunate they literally brought him into the cage to explain what happened and brought a doctor in there to explain it and everything and he laid down the belt I don't know if Paris yeah I don't know that, that, all that stuff with the maybe just because the Hall of Fame thing had gone on for ages um, and then there was there was that going on. The pacing was the only thing I'd criticize about yeah. the, the whole night. Other like you know me, I like the fights to come out quick. But I suppose they only had ten fights on the card in the end, eleven that were scheduled. But yeah, I think um, maybe the 
I think uh, that when the you pacing have, was the only thing that you could criticize. When you have fifty thousand there, you kind of have to make a spectacle out of it, though. And like KSW do make a spectacle out of it anyway, but I, I do think that it is a little bit. It different was just the Hall of Fame thing. There. Yeah, okay, it's a Hall of Fame. It's a you know you're honoring the guy in the Coliseum. It, it, it's pretty cool. But then when you also do the kind of long explanation in the cage, and uh, I don't know, that's a bit much for me. Yeah, it was. It, I I felt bad for uh, for Marion to be honest. He was sitting there like absolutely devastated and his knee was fucked and everything it's like leave this lad alone like just tell us in the broadcast what happened and and move on if you want to bring out Paranas and give him the belt or whatever fair enough stumbling well. around in the cage yeah. <laughs> like, I thought sake. it was I thought knee it. brace on and all like. yeah poor lad I felt sorry for him but that was a great fight and hopefully he can, he can uh, get back and, and they can uh, they can do it again um, outside of that uh, Arthur Spilka beat uh, Marius Pudzianowski Pudge took him down immediately from the start of the fight got on top of him and uh Arthur and just basically hung round. on and just yeah. kept him as close <laughs> as he could <laughs> oh, just shit. Got I let this guy posture up the strength <laughs> of his lap his face just got redder and redder and redder as the whole fight went but then they got up you know as I say every uh, round starts in the feed and Spielke smashed him in the start of the second round knocked him out in 31 seconds so a good win for Spielke there and Pudge Pudge you know not I, I, he didn't seem to be retiring after it so we might uh, we might see him back uh, again um, and the fights after that, Graham, uh, the, the middleweight title on the line, Pavel Pawlak beat Tommy Ramanovsky, knocked him out yeah, with an elbow. Put a, put a pressure on that he couldn't really live with. He, it was only going one way, and I think it was a nice finish, but I think the ref kind of knew that it was only going one way and maybe took a bit of, uh, you know, that into uh, into um, into Comments. consideration yeah. when, uh, when stopping the fight because, yeah, uh, Pavlak was just overwhelming him and just, you know, nothing too spectacular but just just not giving him a second to breathe and just um, just basically coming with, with all he had and, you know, Romanowski put up a good fight for, for a while uh, but he seemed to tire as well and Pavlak looked like he could do it all day and, yeah, it was, a, it was an impressive performance and, you know, it's, it's hard to overcome that, uh, that relentless pressure. We had uh, a very good knockout, kind of a comeback knockout from Michel Materla. Uh, he was the underdog going in there against Vladislav uh, Pazuski. But one of the knockouts of the year, though, the, if, if people haven't seen this, um, Christoph uh, Golvaki got mounted and knocked out his opponent from being mounted hit him with a left hook from the bottom knocked yeah. him out what a knockout he's like a I'm boxer thinking. who didn't know how to grapple and it was like oh god he's been mounted so easily it's this is not looking good and all of a sudden <laughs> he knocked him out all from the bottom with a pretty nice punch in fairness like that was nice like people and, uh, people just need he to was see out, but he made sure with a couple of coffin nails because in fairness to the ref the ref was caught unawares because it just like never a hard one like that, so. a hard one to see and i remember back in the day like literally about 15 years ago i put it up on the ug saying like has anyone ever been knocked out uh from being mounted or and i think there was one or two at that time uh if i could find that uh that trade or whatever but very rare very very rare like, as i said everyone should just send that to tyson fury be like oh look that's what you can do look you can knock lads out from the bottom even if you get taken down you beat john jones no problem get him into it but anyway um yeah, so that was uh, that was uh, KSW unbelievable event, and then we switched over to the UFC. You know, with these random undercard fights with you know Philip Lins and Damon Blackshear and Elise Ray. It was just like, oh, it was it was hard to watch. Honestly, it was it was really hard to watch after watching KSW. But there were some very good performances. There were actually in the middle of the the card. There were some. Two brilliant fights, which I really enjoyed. Um, Mohamed Nayamov against Jamie Malarkey. This Nayamov looks right good. He looks a very, very good fighter. And he's from Tajikistan, as was Munin uh, Gafarov, who I've seen a good few times where he's been in one championship and stuff. But he fought John Castaneda, who looked absolutely fantastic. And that was another very, very, very good fight. So th those two were, were worth uh, tuning in for. Dantella Mays knocked out Andrzej Arlovski, Daniel Santos. And Johnny Munoz, he kept kicking him in the dick. Uh, there was one of me kicked him in the leg, and it slid up and then hit him in the dick, and he took a point for that one. I was like, 
That's a little bit harsh. He like clearly uh, was kicked it for him that in the one, leg. or was it for kind of an accumulation? Accumulation, but that one, it should. I don't think it should have been taken for that one as an accumulation because it was a clearly legal strike. It just happened to slip up. Like is it, is not what we've replay for? Like they had five minutes standing there while Munoz was getting better. Like, can you? I, I honestly don't understand how someone can't see that. They're like, there's clearly extenuating circumstances there. Like he didn't just kick him in the dick. It was a legal strike. Like, I I don't know. Yeah, I, I thought that was very weird. But anyway, it didn't matter in the end. He ended up, uh, he ended up winning the decision anyway. Um, uh, Zelecki de Santos uh, coming off of a, a, a very rare USADA ban for a, a tainted, <laughs> tainted supplement. Uh, beat Abubakar and Magomedov by a split decision. I, I thought that was the right decision, honestly. Held Nurmagomedov and Nurmagomedov tried to hold hold him, hold him against the cage for long periods. Not good enough. Uh, Karina Silva knee barred uh, Ketlin Santos. It was a nasty looking one. It was like, oh, what's on there? And in the replay, Ketlin Souza, yeah, Souza. Uh, she just pulled her knee out basically. Tim Elliott looked good. He beat Victor uh, Alarminto. A lot of uh, takedowns and stuff there. Madness. Jim Miller knocked out Jesse Butler on short notice in twenty three seconds. Just a beautiful shot. What about? He went Jim in there Miller? really throwing hard. He was he really stepping into those bunches. <laughs> he 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 wasn't he wasn't there to to go to three rounds. And you kind of heard from him afterwards. He's looking to get in kind of against a. Uh, the any fight he can get, the exciting, most exciting fights he can get, and you know, I probably would have thought, you know, this this would be a closer fight. I thought Jim Miller, you know, he's getting on. Maybe, maybe he could fade in this one, and it, and it could be a close decision. But you know, he looked pretty good for for a man who's had what 50, 53 fights and been around the UFC for a long time. So you know, fair play to Jim Miller. We've seen a lot of these these guys at the stage of the career that that he's at, and it's it's sad to watch. And you know, he's still he's still going strong. Obviously, it's not the not the the best opponent in the world, but he went straight through him uh, with with no problem and with with a you know a really nice finish, a really powerful, really powerful overhand. Lyme disease, the best or base for MMA. Left. That's what I can. <laughs> <It's a, it's laughs> <a>, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, he did look good though. He wants to fight in UFC three hundred, which will be coming up next year. So I think he can probably do it. I saw. Um, I think it was Damon Martin suggested he he, he fight Matt Brown. He talked about got up to one seventy, so I think that'd be a good fight. Let's let's make that happen next. Why not? Um, so yeah, Miller looked good, and obviously He's still only thirty nine. I thought he would have been in his forties. Yeah, I'm surprised by that. Yeah, he was supposed to fight. So he was supposed to fight Jared Garden, who obviously fought Paddy Pimblett last time out. Uh, and Jared Garden said during the week he was had been dealing with concussion symptoms, and they pulled him out because of that, which I think is. Uh, a very very good uh, thing for the UFC to have done to be honest and uh, probably if you're like I admire him being um, open and honest about it but like fighters should know by now that that's going to happen like it happened to Max Holloway basically didn't it back in the day and if it's going to happen to Max Holloway in a big fight like that it's going to happen to you know some some lad third fight from the top you know so it's and I'm not saying don't say it, but like, I don't know. I, I want, are, are people that stupid like that they don't know their fight's going to be pulled if they say that? I, it, it was a weird one, but he was a lot overweight as well and stuff. I mean, kind of, mm, I'm half wondering, did he know what he was doing? But anyway, that's conspiracy theory hat on there. Um, Alice Caceres and Daniel Pineda then. Um, all I could think of watching this fight was Alex Caceres is number 15 in the world in the UFC at Featherweight, and Paul Hughes is not in the UFC. And, like, I think Paul Hughes would absolutely destroy Alex Cazares and destroy both of these lads, to be honest. Um, it was it was a fun enough fight. It was a good fight, but, like, they were very tired. Pineda, Pineda kept getting tired and then just started fighting normally again for, like, a minute. And then getting I think it was the again. body shots more than getting yeah. tired. I think they were kind of zapping them a bit and he tried to recoup and make it make a recovery and kind of have another little spurt. But, uh, you know, with Alex Caceres, he, sometimes he looks great and in moments he looks he looks great and then in other moments it's just, it's very sloppy. Um, yeah, yeah, as you said about Paul Hughes, you know, if I was Paul Hughes watching a lot of these guys in the, the 145 division, I'd be, I'd be probably getting angry that uh, I'm not getting the call. Yeah, like Cron Gracie last week. Come on, like, oh, Jesus, yeah. just a completely different level. Anyway, the main event. Again, we had judging controversy in the the main event uh, in a fight with four extremely close rounds. Even if you don't say four extremely close rounds, without a shadow of a doubt, three extremely close rounds. So uh, I um, I scored it for Kai Cara France. Amir Albazi got the win. I don't think there was... 
like there probably shouldn't have been much controversy on it. The one thing that people were giving out about it was um, the four round was scored from one judge for Amir Al Bazi, and which did uh, change the result of the fight. And people pulled up the stats as people tend to do, and it was like twenty seven to seven or something like that. And I had like three or four people reply to me. I went back and I watched the four round, and like every single people, I, I and I knew what was coming next. It was like it didn't look like a round that was there was such a strike difference. Sorry, differential it's i don't know it's one of these fi- fights where I, w- I was watching it graham and i tweeted it out and i don't know if you felt the same way because i know you have felt this t- the same way in the past kai cara france gave me a frankie edgar vibe and what i mean by that hitting is there. hitting air missing a lot and you can you can see like there's a lad in the background he's tipping his thing and significant strike, significant strike and he's just hitting air he's hitting nothing or he's hitting arms or something like that uh, there was just so much, and I predicted it. Yeah. I think it was in the fourth. I, think, I think there was a lot of that, but I do also think that he landed the the crisper strikes when he when he did land, and that he did, you know, do enough in round one, four, and five to to win the the decision on my card. But you know, as you said, you know, there wasn't really maybe the fifth round was was clear enough, and the fourth round was quite clear in my opinion. But like, if you <sighs> You know, there's, there's a swing round in the first as well, where it was close as well. There was a lot of um, a lot of hit and air, as you said, a lot of missed punches in that round as well. So, yeah, I I did score uh, 48, 47 for Cara France, but when when it was being announced, I, I was expecting to go either way, and I wasn't at all surprised when it was 48, 47 um, split decision. So, yeah, I could see where people maybe, you know, uh, if you look at the stats and things like that. But yeah, I think. <laughs> I think maybe the maybe the fourth round was clear enough for Carl France that people get mad about that, but I don't think overall for the winner of the fight winning forty eight forty seven discarding the individual round that you agree with. I don't think you can be too upset about no. about um, yeah. Carl France not getting the nod. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, just quickly to go through, like the first round. Uh, as you say, it was it was definitely a swing round. I scored that to Carl France because I thought the first kick that he landed to the calf really hurt Albazi. I thought it reddened it up and I thought he was limping around for like maybe maybe two minutes, maybe even a little bit longer afterwards. And I thought that was the best strike uh, of the round. Otherwise, I think Albazi was probably slightly ahead in that round, but like if a judge doesn't see that or if he doesn't acknowledge it, I can see why he gives it to, to Albazi. There's no problem there. The second round, a, a real toss up like a lot of people had it for Albazi a lot of people had it for Car France I gave it to Albazi the third was the, I think the third was the only clear round uh, of the of the fight that's the one where Albazi kind of dominated that we don't need to speak about that much the I think f- the fifth was was Car France I I, clear, I think the fifth round I actually had Albazi just ahead until the last 30 seconds, but Cara France did landed all the significant strikes in the last 30 seconds, basically for the whole round. So I do think he he did win that, and all three judges did give him that round, I think, um, as well. The four, like the four round was just one of those rounds where very little happened. Like there was no massive significant strike, no, and and like there wasn't even a middling. Uh, I shouldn't use the word significant strike because that gets mixed up but like in the truest word use of the word significant not the, the stupid stat use of it just it was a Frankie Edgar Benson Henderson's art around you know with less output even there was just very little landed by either guy I did I thought Cara France did win and I thought he just did enough like Albazi probably landed a little bit harder in that round, but not like not much. When you see a guy swinging and missing so often, though, like Cara France or just you know tipping off of someone, just base barely missing them, it's and you're judging that and you're looking at it and you're thinking like he's landing nothing of significance here. If Albazi does land something good, he's going to win that round. And this is a big problem, right? This is a big problem with uh, people talking about judging because. There's a phrase I've heard a few times this week, right? An unreliable narrator. And we have so many unreliable unreliable narrators when we're talking about MMA judging. So many of them, right? Because you look at the fight afterwards, or you, you look at Twitter afterwards, you look at the reaction afterwards, right? And the first people, and I, I understand this reaction, right? 
you have bet on Albazi, you've bet on Kai Car France, whatever it might be, and you're mad and you disagree with it. Like you're a Liverpool fan, Graham. If Liverpool lose, you're blaming the referee. You're every I'm Limerick lose, I'm blaming the referee. Man United lose, I'm blaming the referee. It's natural. I do it myself. I couldn't give out to anyone about it, right? But that's an unreliable narrator. They're not telling you a reliable story on the fight, right? We I think we'd all agree with that. But the problem, emotions are involved here. Yeah. Exactly, hundred percent. There's a problem there then though, right? Because I feel like a lot of people covering this sport and a lot of people talking, you know, the, the influencers online, let's say that, are just looking at that reaction and in parroting the same reaction. I would, I would argue that some of them aren't even watching the fucking fight. Like, genuinely. Because if you're pulling up stats... Uh, even if people are this. watching the fight, how are they on their phone a yeah. little bit? Like, I know I'm going to have to talk to the score about you, uh, with you afterwards, so I'm kind of paying attention to try and watch the fight but also try to score the fight as best I can if uh, you know um, if like I'm obviously no expert but I'm trying to you know I'm going to give an opinion on it so I have to kind of pay attention but these guys are probably you know could be anyway they could be like you know eating or you know uh, on their phone or distracted in some way and um, kind of half listen to the commentary and the commentary can sometimes you know give you a false impression of what's happening and things like that so yeah a lot of that comes into it and all as you said bets and and you know um people picked a guy or people are fan, fans of a guy or, or, you know, it, it ruins their accumulator or, or sometimes they, people don't really understand the scoring criteria. Like we were watching exactly. Katie Taylor, Katie Taylor bout. And I was saying to you, well, how do you think this, this, this kind of happened? How is it scored in boxing? I don't really know because <laughs> I don't follow, but I don't know the criteria. Well, we're for scoring smart and, enough to say that. Like, no, we don't watch boxing. We don't really know. I'll give you my score, but like take it with a pinch of salt. Whereas there's people actually like, in talking about MMA and they're like this is an absolute robbery because it's not scored this way. it's like you probably read the criteria once three years ago so I understand that never talk to a judge never try to break it down or anything like that and it's like I, I honestly it frustrates me so much and then people are coming out I was talking about Ariel last night even on, on Twitter oh, the judges need to come out the judges need to explain this to us but if the ju- what are the judges explaining, right? You're explaining it to people who don't want it explained to them. I've tried to explain to them. We, I just went through all five rounds there and explained exactly how a judge would score it one way or another. Well, right? At the end of the day, it's an opinion. Like if you like you say, oh, Sean Sheehan's the judge and Ben Carter's the other judge, I say, for example. Um, and there's a dissenting round, that first round. Ben doesn't think that calf kick was the, the problem. He Maybe he thought he saw a, a kind of twist of the ankle, a yeah. misstep, and that was what caused the, the limping. And you thought it was the, the calf kick, and that scores, scores the round uh, for different guys and ends up scoring because it's 2-2 two, two going but uh, that's grand, right? from the second to the fifth round. So it's an opinion thing as well. It, but you explain that, and our people, like, here is the crux of it, right? That's a perfect example, right? I score it one way, Ben scores it the other way. He comes out and explains it, I come out and explain it. Do you think people are going to take that in face value? Or are they going to say, these judges are completely apart. They don't know what they're watching. They, they should be decided the next day when they can all agree and, 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 and they should be in a soundproof room and a boot. And It's just but going like even to be that. Even in the PGMOL in soccer, in the Premier League, of people who don't follow football, uh, English Premier League football, the the ref will come out, um, or the ref uh, head, Howard Webb, came out on Monday Night Football and like picked and choose which kind of you know, oh, we're going to show you how we made these decisions and picked and choose it and, you know, and showed how the decisions we were making and didn't make anybody happier. It just made people more annoyed. Exactly. Well, what about this one? What about this one? Exactly. Oh, you ignored this one. And, you know, they did ignore that one. And obviously they're not going to make themselves look stupid. Uh, nobody wants to go on TV and make themselves look stupid. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I uh, honestly, I would love if we were at a place where the judges or the commission or whatever could come out after every fight and explain it and people would be willing to actually take that explanation or even understand it you can disagree i'm not saying everyone needs to agree at all but like i've said it many times about judging it's it's not about agreeing it's about understanding and if you can't understand that Amir Albazi could have won that fight. Like, uh, I think Sal Diamata scored the first three rounds for Albazi. If you cannot understand that, you might not agree with that. I don't agree with it. I didn't score it the fight that way, right? But if you can't understand that, we are never going to get to a point where the judges coming out explaining their score is going to make a difference. Because you're going to be mad regardless. I just explained to you how three, the first three rounds have been, could be given to Albazi. 
Why is that not enough? Now, I don't even say, oh, yeah, you're a judge on all that. But you know what I mean? If a judge came out and said the exact same thing I said, what difference would it actually make? Because the criteria is there. We know how rounds and fights are judged. If you look at that, you actually don't need the explanation for a judge. You can go and watch the fight itself and say to yourself, this round could have gone this way or that way. And then after, just be okay with that because that's how it fucking works. And people are probably well, sometimes saying, you know, this is probably a bad example for all of this. So like but sometimes there is, you know, like an egregious decision over the years, and people are like, "How did you possibly score for this guy when when this 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 and this big impact strike happened, and this guy only did this, and it's it's egregious." There, there has been that in the past, but in my opinion, not in a long time. And um, you know, for using a boxing kind of scoring system and adapting it to MMA and, you know, not having that many, you know, judges that are at the top level. I think, you know, in fairness, from what, they, what they're dealing with compared to other sports, it's pretty, the standard is pretty good, like uh, of judging and, and refereeing as well most of the time. So, you know, it has been a lot worse in the past and, you know, we have called out robberies yes. year, in years gone by and uh, like we're not afraid to call something a robbery but yeah I think th- this one and a lot of the ones recently that have been that have been having people up in arms are, are razor razor close round swinging decisions and yeah that's always going to happen in MMA this, these guys are you know, well matched made guys are very close and they both know how to win both fighters know how to, to eke out rounds and that's what they're trying to do and uh, a lot of fights where, where, where the competition levels or the, the skill levels are similar so yeah it's just it's, it's got to deal with it it's just the way it's going to be it's going to be different opinions and it's going to be swing rounds that people disagree with but yeah i definitely wouldn't be putting this anywhere near a robbery no and people like we have to okay with ourselves as well that close rounds are going to be close rounds and close rounds are going to lead to close fights there's no way around that there's no system around unless we finished every fight there is no way around it you can do it. I watch one championship all the time. We'll talk about it here in a minute. They have a card coming up next week. They judge the fight as a full. It's the same thing. I watched a fight last year, Christian Knee fight, and I thought it was an absolute. I, I thought it was a robbery, <laughs> you know, because it was it was it looked clear and it didn't go that way. It doesn't happen with that either. It's it's. it's but we need to realize this. We need a close fight. Is a close fight, and we, we all you know we also need to realize and we'll move on after this, but. MMA is not like other sports, and we need to stop comparing it to other sports. If Man United are playing Liverpool and Liverpool score seven goals, they win the game, right? Amir al Bazi could have won all four rounds last night, could have destroyed him, 10 8 him, and Kai Carafrance could have landed a knockout in the last second of the fifth round of one, right? That can happen. MMA is different to other sports. It is different to other sports. And we need to recognize that and realize that. And we need to realize the scoring of MMA is way, 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 way more nuanced than other sports. Like I was thinking about, let's say it's a basketball game, right? There's, you can score one point, you can score two points, and you can score three points. And that is the top and bottom of it, right? If you score 90 points in a game, there's a breakdown of three ways those 90 points have been scored, right? And you know, you can get a great idea of it. In MMA, if you think about it, right, how many different ways there is to score, how many different ways there is to win a round. Like, did you catch him someone in a rear naked choke and almost choke him out? Did you catch him in an armbar? Did you punch him with your right hand? Did you punch him with your left hand? Did you kick him in the right leg? Did you kick him in the left leg? Did you kick him in the tie? Did you kick him in the, the calf on the left leg? The, the calf on the right leg, the tie in the... There's so many different ways of scoring. And then there's also, like, minutes. for the, for example, the ask him knee bar. You have to put in how close is this submission? Yes. Is this just wasting time? Is this, you know, is this threatening? Or you have to take all that into account as well. So there's so many things to take into account for, you know, everything that's happening. And there's and so many things that can How happen. in God's name is someone going to come out afterwards and explain that to people who don't have a full knowledge of that in the first place? How? Like, we are asking for trouble if people do that. And that's why they're not doing it. I asked Ariel last night three or four times, why do you think they're not doing it? And I, like, I, I, I've asked a few people down through the years and no one gives an explanation because we know the explanation. We know what the explanation is. The judges won't come out and do it because they're on a fucking, they're on a victory to nothing. Like, they're not, they're not going to win by come out explaining it to people who do not want it explained to. 
uh, any Graham, any referee could come out and explain after a Liverpool match and you won't give a bollocks. You're going to still think he was a, a joke and he made terrible decisions. And I'd be the same with Man United or Limerick and Harlan or whatever it might be. And if I was watching a boxing match and I had bet on fucking Deontay Wilder and uh, someone gave it to him and I had fucking 100 quid on it and they gave it to his opponent, I'd be the same. I wouldn't give a bollocks with any judge. Yeah, even when, you know, the PGMOL, the Premier League came out last season, the season before last and apologised to Everton for a decision that went against them and for City but it didn't make a difference you know the apology is no. nothing uh, everything ended up staying up on the last day and not getting relegated but that could have relegated them and what's an apology going to do like it makes no difference really. but it's not even an apology yeah I, I don't think any I definitely don't think they become an apology but even, even if you did come out and say here I actually watched that back and yeah, I, yeah. I actually scored it wrong sorry about that in the time I thought that this happened from my vantage point blah 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 blah, blah. sorry about it like it makes no difference anyway no I I'd, I'd love if we were in a place where we could no, not the apology, but the explanation. If we could do it, but I, I just don't think like it makes no sense for them to do it. They're just on a hiding to nothing. They really are. Anyway, we'll move on. We haven't had a judging rant in a while, so there you go. There's there's another one again. But this was just one of those fights with four four close rounds and people calling around. Next next time those. we're at an event, we'll corner Ben with um, a microphone and fire all these questions at him. And see what he says. <laughs> I've already done that. There's a podcast up I tweeted out there last night, if, and it's in the description if you're watching this in SevereMed.com. Uh, we there's want one to be more confrontational. Like you know, we want to be like corner him and like yeah. force him into you know, force, <laughs> force him into him. answer, force torture him, him maybe. Yeah. Answer all that, all that <laughs> it's already fucking torture having to listen to people talking about judging. So, uh, right, let's uh, let's move on. Actually, let's talk about tough before we move to, to next week, Graham. Um, I my uh, my very quick um review of tough is tough was tough. It was just nothing exact changed. Same. <laughs> exact same. You know, there was uh, the the clip that had already been out there of Connor and Chandler talking. There was no shit talk. There was a good knockout by Roosevelt Roberts. Uh, Lee Hammond didn't say one word, I don't think, in the whole thing. Connor and Chandler didn't do much. It was very boring, I thought. What, what did you think of it? Um, yeah, well, for me and you, who've I don't know how many seasons you've watched, or I don't even know how many seasons I've watched uh, over the years, but uh, I've watched a lot of seasons of my fighter, and it, it's very formulaic at this stage. But I suppose, like I said this before on the podcast uh, a few weeks ago, or when it was announced or whatever, it's, it's not really for... Us, it's you know it's going on ESPN. It's it's probably trying to more drag in casuals to want to see what Connor what Connor's going to do or what Chandler's going to do uh, with Connor, blah blah blah, all that stuff, and get a fight at the end and hopefully hook them hook them into the UFC and get them to get them to become fans. So yeah, I think I think for people who've watched a lot of seasons of Ultimate Fighter, it's probably going to be a lot of the same. There probably will be you know some funny moments and things like that. Uh, you know, the the one minute kind of season preview at the end, uh, there was some pretty funny moments, like after the stare down where Connor pushed Chandler, you can see Dana kind of running in quicksand in, in, in the background trying to get into the cage, which, which looks quite funny. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that, but they didn't really show too many much of the characters of the of the other fighters that that weren't fighting. You know, they obviously did the 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 family things with the with the two fighters that were fighting but yeah i think you know it hasn't drawn me in that i'm looking forward a lot to the next episode but at the same time i don't think it's really for us uh kind of bitter and twisted veterans yeah that's a that's a fair point but like who who is it for really i don't i, I don't know i know you said maybe new people coming in but i don't know if, yeah, if you're flicking around you, like you know sky sports news over here people just flick around kind of around sky sports sky sports news maybe they're flicking around espn they see they see conor mcgregor oh what's going on here and yeah, maybe. you know maybe maybe they can hook some people in maybe that's the idea or you know obviously they're they haven't been on it's kind of been hidden away the ultimate fighter for the last while you wouldn't even know what's going on and there has been a bit of a push so I haven't seen any numbers or anything uh, of, of how it did, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, if it, you know, continues to do good numbers and despite it kind of just being the same old, same old. Yeah. I, I, the first episode used to be two hours before, wasn't it? And the fact that this was only an hour, it felt very rough. Preliminary fights and yeah. have like, you know, what was it, like eight or ten fights under the, yeah. the first season, but I haven't watched it in a, in, a, in a few seasons, so um, I think so sometimes, yeah, sometimes they, they had fights get into the house and sometimes they didn't, I'm not sure, I'm not sure why. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's right, but um, yeah, look, hopefully, uh, hopefully Lee Hammond does well, and I, I think 
I probably won't be tuning in for uh, for uh, again until his fight, to be honest. And if I do hear something on Twitter or something about, you know, Connor and Chandler maybe going at each other or something or a bit of drama, I'll tune in to watch that. But like, I, I think a big problem with the with Tough and that they haven't really acknowledged uh, is the fights or action the fights were people tuned in for early doors because we didn't have that many fights you know there was four cards a year or ten cards a year or whatever it might be and like oh fine on the wins uh, brilliant let's do it now we see a thousand fights every week you know we have KSW we had the UFC we have PFL coming up we have UFC the week after we have more PFL and then we better we fight all the time it was actually like the drama on the show that was keeping people in and then they just took away the drama it's just these cookie cutter athletes now it's like no that's that's not interesting like they're the most boring people in the world because well we did see boring. a bunch of bottles of proper 12 and forged stout in the house yeah, hopefully so maybe that helps. Some <laughs> yeah come on like get a junie browning or <laughs> Let's save us, Connor. yeah we need we need connor to save us by getting lads absolutely twisted out of their heads drop a few bags of fucking cocaine and <laughs> we'll see how it goes tell you sad the fuck up but yeah that's uh, i but i'm not hopeful for that like i know i don't think there'll be any great drama like maybe connor and Chandler a bit but you know every interview I've seen with Connor he goes I like Michael and he's a good chap and all so it doesn't seem like there's much apart from that one big push so yeah I don't think I'll be uh, I don't think I'll be tuning in weekly apart from Lee Hammond and you know anyway right UFC 289 next week Graham um Jesus uh terrible 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 card if we're, if we're being honest for a, a pay-per-view um the gra- look at uh, one I don't know that's the co-main event though. I'm really looking Brilliant, forward to yeah, that one and I'm really looking fight. forward to seeing how Amanda Nunes looks yes. just because of how many questions are around her and is she still the same and all that stuff so maybe not the you know the highest quality Everything card overall shite. but there is some interesting some interesting stuff at the top for me yeah I, I, I really like the co-main event and I'm interested in the, th- in the top one but like this is supposed to be a UFC pay-per-view and the third fight from the top is Mike Mallott against Adam Fugit now I know Mike Mallott is like the Canadian guy and whatever and that's I have no problem with that but like you have Mark andre Barriolt against Eric Anders on the main card of a UFC pay-per-view. You have Danny Gay against Nate Landwehr. Like, what are we doing here? Like, in all seriousness, this is, uh, it's not great, but we don't, look, we don't want to get into more complaining about that. We, I think everyone knows at this stage, so what's the point? Uh, let's talk about the, the, the two big fights, I suppose, up near the top. Um, and we... Let's talk about Charles Oliveira and Benil Darius first, and we we leave the Nunes and Aldana one till till the end. Um, look, I think a lot of people are probably of the same mind as me in that Darius should be getting the shot now. Like, there's no number one contender there clearly for Makachev. Why is he even having this? He's in an unbelievable run. Makachev has already beaten Charles Oliveira. If the if he wins here and he's the number one contender, like is. I'd watch the fight again. I think it'd be fun, but like, is that the prime matchup you would want when you already have a, another fight uh, lined up that would make a lot of sense that was supposed to happen and that people would be uh, hyped for? Uh, this is, seems to me like an unnecessary risk. Now, that's uh, I don't know. Like, Darius is definitely on a really good run, and like, I'm a, I'm, I'm a fan of his, but if you look at the, the record, the guys he's beaten aren't really, you know, anywhere near the same level as the people Charles Oliveira has been, been fighting in his last. Uh, five fights so yeah I think you know if he had got a title shot I probably wouldn't wouldn't be arguing but I wouldn't be saying that you know he's been he's been um fecked over yeah. <laughs> here I don't know like, uh, he beat Gamrat in his last one like when he when he did beat Tony Ferguson it was it's back a, it's in a very good win but like yeah, Tony Ferguson oh, yeah. I'm not gonna go into this again like, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I just like he's on such a good run. He's won, won so many fights in a row. They were supposed to fight. Yeah, I, I don't know. But it, it just because there's there really isn't anyone else. Like you're taking this unnecessary risk, in my opinion. But having said that, forget about that because it's a great fight. I, I like it's so interesting because it, it feels a little bit like these both of these guys have um, adjusted their own games in a similar sort of way, like Darius and, and Oliveira a few years ago were good fighters who 
we're getting knocked out the odd time and we're showing issues and then they've become lads who are going out there landing big fucking shots going at lads and either knocking them out or you know knocking them down and I think we even had a conversation it. about Darius mm-hmm. years ago is is his chin good enough for, for the very top level yeah. you know what I mean I think we had that conversation a good few years ago and he's kind of completely put that you know out of out of thought and out of mind because of the streak he's been on and the fact that he's you know he he definitely trusts his chin the way the way he's willing to trade so um, yeah that's kind of you know, a question that's kind of been erased. And with Charles Oliveira, obviously there was kind of diff- different problems, you know, uh, mental kind of lapses and maybe maybe things like that. They were holding him back and he seemed to put it all together. And, you know, he's de- he definitely goes balls to the wall as well and not afraid to to let thing, to let um, things things fly. So this, this could really be an absolute barn burner while it lasts. And, you know, uh, I don't know, like uh, Charles Oliveira has been you know, fighting higher caliber guys and putting them away. Obviously, he lost his last one to, to Makachev, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, this is a really interesting one. I don't really know how it's going to look, and I think it could go either way. I, I think if it goes long, and Darius is definitely going to have a bit of an advantage there, but early on, I think it, this really could be could be a finish by either guy. Yeah, and we're talking about chin, chins getting tested. Well, if there's any man out there who tests chins, it's Charles Oliveira. And <laughs> I think Darius, if, he, if that has, uh, if there's any lingering issues there, uh, or you know things being papered over, I think Charles Oliveira absolutely will expose that early, uh, and I think he will hit him hard and probably hurt him and probably knock him down or maybe knock him out uh, in the first round. But obviously, uh, aside from the being knocked out part, if Darius can get through that. As you said, the longer the fight goes, you think it would benefit him. But not even not, not even that. I just think if he f- survives the initial onslaught and can maybe get a takedown or maybe start landing a few shots of his own and push Oliveira back, it's a, it turns into a very winnable fight for him very, very quickly then. But it's a very tough fight to win early. And if he cannot change that tide, it's going to be very hard to stop that tide. You're literally going to be drowned by it. And... Honestly, like this is, uh, this is a fight, right? Where if you're Benil Dariush's coach and you want him to get a win here, I think you have to take Charles Oliveira down very quickly. That's in in my opinion because most people thought it would be inadvisable because of how good Charles is on the ground. But Benil's jujitsu is unbelievable, and his top game is unbelievable as well. Now, famous last words: you might get fucking strangled or armbarred or something, but. I think he has a better chance on the ground against Oliveira than almost anyone else in that division, and um, you know, nearly everyone in that division. So I think, I think that's probably the way to do it. Do I think that's going to happen? And I'm not too sure. I think it's going to be a Rock'em Sock'em Robots type of uh, type of fight, and I think it's absolutely going to be brilliant. As much as uh, you know, Benil Dariush has been Team Sheehan for a long, long time. Uh, I think Oliveira is probably going to get the knockout here, and he's going to get it early. I would say, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Um, Nunes and Aldana Din Graham. This is oh, this is a an interesting fight because. Amani Nunes came out in the first fight against Juliana Pena, looked like five dollars instead of a million dollars, got absolutely destroyed, came back in the second fight, won it, and look, she kind of got better, I suppose, as the fight went, but I thought she looked very shaky, didn't look herself. And nervous, was, very nervous. Very nervous, her. yeah. If there was someone better on that day, I think they probably would have beaten her. Now did she have a bad day in the first one and was nervous in the second one? Or was she bad in the first day, slightly improved in the second day, and it's a downward trajectory she's going in? I I, I would say the latter, I think. It, it, like it, it feels like the signs point to a downward trajectory to me. And I'll, if, if that's the truth, as you said earlier on, and I've said it for the last few weeks, I think Aldana will win this fight. I, I really do if if that's the case now if it's not and Nunes comes out and fights her best I think she'll probably destroy Aldana but I don't know if that's possible anymore like it's very very hard to question someone like Amanda Nunes who is the undisputed without a shadow of a doubt goat like there's no doubt about it we can t- talk about Dimitri Johnson and John Jones and GSP and Anderson Silva on the on the men's side and you know we have arguments every way but there's no argument on the women's side it is Amanda Nunes and everyone agrees with that and it's difficult to speak about her in such a fashion that like oh she finished kind of a thing but 
That's what we're that's what we're paid to do. That's to that happens to everybody, choose. you know. You want to and Jacek was in a similar position yeah. years ago, and you know, uh, the game moves on quickly. And if you're not at the top of the game and not improving, you're going to get caught. And as you said, is a lot as as we all both said, there's a lot of jeopardy around, a lot of questions around this one. Did she, you know she's been caught on a couple of times, not really in. Amanda Nunes has been caught really not really in proper shape. How seriously is she taking this? Is is this still you know? really important to her if it is you know and she is in shape and i expect her to come in and win you know i don't expect her to go in and like prime amanda nunes and blow blow the brakes off and knock her out early like that could happen like she definitely has power and and is capable of but i wouldn't be as confident as that anymore i think this is going to be a closer fight but I, I still would pick amanda nunes but if i see her coming in and she's not looking great on the scale and things like that then you know i might i might be changing my pick yeah, I, I think I'm picking Aldana, if I'm being honest. I just, uh, I think she is, she's a good fighter. And I think the, the fact that Alexa Grasso won against Valentina Shashinko made her maybe believe a little bit. And if if she has that belief, if Nunes is not the fighter she once was, I think she is primed and ready to beat her. But as you said, if Nunes turns, like if Nunes yeah, turns it's, up, it's also Aldana's first title shot against an absolute legend who can put you away. Like, you know, she may be the, the moment could affect her a little bit as well. You know, Amanda Nunes has been there a million times. And even though there is a lot of pressure on champions, you know, she, she's felt that pressure a lot of times and, you know, fought in big fights. So maybe that could play into it as well. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting fight, and usually, like when Amanda Nunes fights over the last few years, they haven't been that interested. And there's like she doesn't talk that much. Um, added to the fact that she was just going to destroy everyone, and we couldn't really get hype for it. But now we have that level of hype, and it's it's funny how how things change so quickly. Herself and um, herself and Valentina Shashinko now seem as vulnerable as they've ever seemed in terms of the their their place at the top of their divisions. And you know what? That's that's good for them in a way, eh? and great for the UFC and great for MMA in general because the the level has has risen, and that's uh, yeah. And when you're on top for so long, like somebody like Shushenko or Ian Jacek or Amanda Nunes, now people are coming up, starting in MMA, watching you, yes. trying to learn how to beat you, constantly, like you know, working on things and and watching your game, and you know, well, Amanda Nunes would have no idea who these people are, so yeah, that that can play a factor as well. I like can. The hunger, the hunger thing. I think how much does Amanda Nunes want? Is how much work has she been putting in? And if she has, if she is, you know, uh, all in on this and has been putting in the work and is, you know, relatively injury free for an MMA camp, then uh, I'd, I'd find it hard to pick to pick against her. If she comes in a really good shape, look, looking chiseled on the scale, then I, I'd probably go with her. But yeah, I, I, like a couple of years ago, I'd be, I'd be making a, a her to finish uh, first or second round. But uh, I won't. Uh, like it's just hard to make that call now. There's too many unknowns. Indeed, indeed. Uh, there's also PFL cards next week uh, with some of their top talent on it. The main event uh, is Brendan Lachnan against uh, Jesus Pinedo. Um, it's look a good fight. You you think Lachnan would be a favorite there? Although Pinedo is a good fighter, a good striker, um, good movement in the outside, good low kicks and things like that. I, I'll have a full preview of this up on Sherdog anyway. We can talk a little bit more about it. But some Thursday of the, night as well, a bit of the WEC vibes. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Some of the uh, standout fights in it. I love the fight in in uh, featherweight as well. Uh, Mavlid Kabulayev against Tyler Diamond. Very interesting fight. Tyler Diamond is a top level wrestler. Uh, I think he's in uh, Team Alpha Male, uh, and Mavlid is obviously a really, really good wrestler as well. But uh, Mavlid fought Lance Palmer, his teammate, a few years ago, uh, and struggled a little bit. Now he won the fight, but he, he couldn't take him down. And I think Tyler Diamond's maybe a, little, a bit of a better wrestler even than than Lance, and he's a good striker as well. So that's maybe a flying under the radar type of fight there. I think that'll be uh, pretty good, but. As we know, the light heavyweight tournament has been absolutely decimated with all the drug test failures, and um, you know it's there's some new fights announced and things. Ty Flores against Dan Spawn, Sam K is fighting the Martin Hamlet, uh, Impa Kasangani is fighting Tim Karen. So yeah, there, Marlon Morris is back here as well. Obviously, at featherweight fighting Gabriel Braga, who's undefeated ten and all. Uh, Joshua Silveri against Dylan Montes. So there, you know there's some good fights uh, on this uh, on this card, and uh, obviously in Brendan. Nan is, is fun, so that should be uh, that should be good now, and we'll we'll all be tuned in, and we'll all be uh, we'll be wa- all watching it. There's one championship card as well uh, coming up. There's some very good if you're a fan of the the old footboxing and the jujitsu. There's some good stuff uh, on this, but uh, at the um, 
The featherweight division, Ilya Fremenov is could be the number one contender here. He's fighting uh, Shinny. And this lad, if you haven't seen him, look look him up in short dog. I mean, his name is like Shin Gagcha Zoltzeg, but they call him Shinny. This lad is fucking insane. He's like, I, I described him as like, he's a mix between Michel Pereira, N- Nick Diaz, and Conor McGregor or something. <laughs> he's just fucking insane. Uh, absolute class to watch. But yeah, there's probably a number one contender fight then as well uh, in the strawweight division. Mansour Mashaliev against Jeremy Miado. Uh, Mashaliev is 10 and 0 coming out of Russia. And uh, he is he could be fighting uh, the the champion there if he wins that. Artem Belak against uh, Kwan Win Il as well. A good fight. And Hong Young against uh, Sung Hung Woo. But I will have a preview for that as well as I said over in Sherdog. So, uh, yeah, there's some uh, some good MMA coming up this weekend. The weekend after then, we're, we're going to have Bellator. We're going to have another PFL. And that Bellator card is is the Bellator card of the year. Absolutely unbelievable card coming up on the on the 16th. Romero Nimkov, Pettis against Pitbull, Corey Anderson, Phil Davis, our very own Carl Moore, my best friend against Alex uh, Polizzi, uh, and uh, Richie Smolin on the card as well against uh, Timur uh, Kisriev, ranked 12 and all. Right. Big fight. Carl Moore's, be- Carl Moore's beefing with so many severe members, he can't even remember <laughs> who's who. <laughs> remember <laughs> mixing us all up but sure but uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that next week anyway because that isn't coming up for uh for two weeks so we'll uh yeah we'll leave it there. any more graham any any other mma news ranting before we go bit of uh it was a jam-packed week what that as always but sure look yeah no, it was, it was, it was, shout out to ksw it was a uh, it was yeah. great to see you know that they could put on an event like that and obviously uh the production values are always, are always really really high and the, the fights you know there was finishes there was excitement there was comeback so yeah a great night for ksw and great to see them doing such good things in europe kind of under the radar but yeah uh, obviously not under the radar on that side of the world Indeed, indeed. All right, everyone, we will uh, we will leave it there. Uh, hope uh, you're maybe out listening to to this having a barbecue or something like that and enjoying the good times. And if you want to throw us a fiver, you can go over to patreon.com forward slash severe MMA podcast and sign up there. It's the start first week of the month now, so it's a great time. I've actually went back this week, Graham, and I uh, tagged all of the Speaker's Corner episodes and the Chasing Pack episode. So if you go onto the main page on Patreon, you'll be able to click the tab. And I think there's 68 episodes of Speaker's Corner. I think like around 50 episodes of the Chasing Pack. So you can go back and listen to all of them. Obviously, the, the Speaker's Corner episodes are good forever because they're they're specific topics. So uh, there's another one coming this week, actually, on point deductions. So there was a bit of controversy on point deductions at the weekend. This Thursday, point deductions on Speaker's Corner. Myself and Harry very much disagreed on that. So it's a, a, a more of a debate, Speaker's Corner, this time. So tune in and uh, and listen to that. And uh, yeah, if you haven't signed up yet, we'd really appreciate it. You know, we're to keep the lights on. We need a bit of support. You know, the it's very hard, obviously, and the numbers have kind of fallen away over the last while because it, you know, Netflix and charging and fucking Paramount and all of that. So we we understand, but we we'll keep going anyway. But if you could support us with a five or a month or with plus tax, I think it is, uh, that'd be absolutely brilliant. But if not, or if, no you're, if you're broke, you can head over to the YouTube and subscribe and watch watch a few of the yeah. videos over there. It would help. We we got demonetized for a few months, and oh, yeah, when you're back. demonetized, it takes you. It kind of doesn't put you in the algorithm and you're you know the momentum we had the, the viewers we were getting and the, we kind of steadily built kind of you know flatline there for a while because of that demonetization thankfully we finally got the the ads back but uh yeah if you could go over and subscribe to severe may youtube you can see all the severe may stuff at uh, severe forward slash links indeed indeed all right we will uh we will leave it there thank you to everybody for listening and we will let you go now on Graham's quote for the week. Graham. Oh, here in London, home of the brash, outrageous and free, you are repressed, but you're remarkably dressed. Is it real? We'll see you next week. Good luck. Bye now.